Executive Director at National Whistleblower Center, and I'm so happy to be joined here by members of the Make It Safe Coalition. Today, we're going to be talking about some of our most important legislative initiatives, and I'd like to ask Tom to start by introducing Make It Safe and telling us a little bit about what the coalition does. Sure. Thank you, Siri. The Make It Safe Coalition is a trans-ideological, nonpartisan um, uh, group of about 75 organizations dedicated to strengthening whistleblower rights. Um, it was founded around the millennium by Project on Government Oversight and GAP, just to kind of make our efforts more organized. And it's actually the, the roots of the National Whistleblower Summit, uh, which we're so grateful that Mike and Marcel have taken over leadership for. Great, thank you so much. So I wanna start by going around and talking to everybody about their individual organizations and the specific legislative interests each one of those organizations have. So I'll start with you, Melissa. Sure, hi, Siri, and thanks so much for inviting Pogo to participate. We really appreciate it. Uh, so hi, everyone, my name is Melissa Wasser. I'm the policy counsel at the Project on Government Oversight, or POGO. Um, I've been with POGO since January, and I work on a portfolio of whistleblower reform, court access, FOIA reform, and OLC transparency. Uh, a little bit about the Project on Government Oversight. We're a nonpartisan independent watchdog that investigates and exposes waste, fraud, and abuse, and corruption. Uh, and when the government fails to serve the public or when they silence those who report wrongdoing, including whistleblowers. Uh, our organization's legislative work, we work uh, across our teams um, and our public policy advocacy really seeks to help create that more effective, ethical and accountable federal government. So we push for different policy reforms that ensure that we address systemic issues uncovered by our investigations. Um, and that includes protecting the ability of government employees and contractors to come forward when they witness waste, fraud, or abuse of power in the federal government without fear of retaliation. We also do work on increasing transparency and access to government information to ensure the American people can be confident decisions are being made in the best interest. Uh, we work a little with IGs as well to make sure they have the resources and independence um, and make sure that we uh, keep having democracy and we have that constitutional system of checks and balances. Very interesting. What about you, Steve? Uh, hi, I'm Steve Cohn. I'm the chairman of the board of the National Whistleblower Center. And our goal is to provide assistance to whistleblowers. Uh, we support legal cases. We do education and outreach, and we're very active on the Hill, uh, trying to make sure that good laws don't get repealed, that bad laws don't get passed. And we work in a completely nonpartisan basis, and we're very happy to be here today and working with the excellent Make It Safe Coalition that has had a real impact, positive impact on the legal system. Thank you, Steve. Andrew? Uh, thanks, Siri, and hey, everyone. My name is Andrew Lotz. I'm the Director of Federal Policy at National Taxpayers Union, or NTU. Uh, NTU was founded in 1969. We're actually the nation's oldest taxpayer advocacy organization. And so uh, we come at whistleblower issues uh, really from the taxpayer's perspective. And uh, I think I don't need to tell anyone watching this panel or joining us on this panel that whistleblowers for decades now have played a key role in helping with reduce wasteful uh, spending across the federal government, pointing out abuse of federal funds so that, um, so that when federal agencies are dispersing money either to other parts of the federal government or to uh, private contractors or to private grantees, that uh, that money is being spent in the way that Congress intended and that uh, the grantees and the contractors and the federal agencies spending federal dollars are doing right by taxpayers. And, and so, um, you know, uh, we, we, we've been proud to be part of the Make It Safe Coalition uh, uh, for years, if not decades now. Tom could give you a better sense of the history uh, than I could, given I've only been at NTU for two years. But uh, really, uh, we, while we don't have the granular, while we don't always have the granular expertise that our friends at, at Gap or Pogo have, um, 
uh, and while we uh, don't uh, actually work um, on individual whistleblower cases like many other organizations in our space do, one thing that we spend a lot of time and energy doing is uh, communicating with our Republican friends on Capitol Hill about why whistleblower protections are so important, not only to you know make sure that we're doing right by the courageous individuals who step up and speak out uh, every day um, and, and call out waste in, uh, waste in federal spending and abuse of government power, but uh, also to make the, the, the more plain dollars and cents case that whistleblowers save taxpayers money, they are taxpayer guardians, uh, and they are really the cornerstone of, of, of government efforts to, to prevent against waste, fraud, and abuse. So that's really where we come at these issues and looking forward to the discussion today. Thanks so much. Yeah, thank you, Andrew. What about you, Jackie? So I, I feel like the new kid on the block, Whistleblowers of America was incorporated in 2017. And it's a peer support model for employees who have experienced retaliation, discrimination, and harassment mm -hmm. in the workplace. We are organized around the idea that it takes a network to uh, understand these cases. Even before you know you need an attorney, you need a friend and you need somebody you can talk to who can help you walk through the process. So I started this and I use a, a trauma-informed perspective because I had, uh, and I'm a social worker by background, I've spent over 30 years of my career with the military working with combat vets and military trauma. And I saw a lot of the same things among employees who were dealing with a hostile work environment that I saw in my combat vets. And I'm a former army officer. I've been at the Pentagon. Um, I got involved with whistleblowing when I reported what I felt was a conflict of interest over suicide prevention funding and was desperately seeking someone to talk to. And, started connecting with other employees who really saw the need. And when we started really sharing our stories, people were really um, expressing and exposing the fact that they, they were having anxiety, depression, nightmares. They were being bullied. They were fearful. They were losing their jobs. They were struggling with homelessness and divorce and suicidal ideation. And, and it was really talking to somebody who told me they had a gun that made me decide we needed to incorporate whistleblowers of America. So the advocacy and the policy that I'm most interested in is um, to ensure that the I ideas of psychosocial dynamics and the harm caused by retaliation, discrimination, and harassment in the workplace is included in a lot of the language um, and the legislation and the policy that the Make It Safe Coalition looks at and anybody who will ask me to talk, that's my um, that's my go-to. We really need to understand mental health parity and whistleblower retaliation law. Thank you so much. All right, Tom. Um, the Government Accountability Project was founded in 1977, which means that um, we're only whippersnappers compared to the National Taxpayers Union. Uh, and during that time, we've um, um, worked with about 8,000 whistleblowers, formally or informally. And should add that one of our, for sure, our most famous alumnus is Steve Cohn, um, before he went on to bigger and better things at the National Whistleblower Center. <laughs> um, uh, we kind of wear four hats uh, helping whistleblowers. One is defending them against retaliation, everything from informal investigations to a successful Supreme Court test to the Whistleblower Protection Act. Um, we investigate their charges, help them make a difference. because It's so easy to um, have the point of whistleblowing lost in the struggle for survival. Uh, and so we've, we've helped them to stop nuclear power plants that were accidents waiting to happen, um, uh, stop the next generation of Star Wars, get national milk testing, prevent deregulation of meat inspection, get dangerous drugs off the market. Um, currently, um, the abuses of immigration have been a real high priority for our organization. Um, third thing we do is share our lessons learned. We have a, a DC Law School clinic and put out publications with survival guides from every angle. Um, uh, and just finished a, a study with the International Bar Association evaluating all the world's whistleblower laws, um, uh, all 48 nations now that uh, have laws um, 
uh, on paper and then the laws in reality, their track records for them. Uh, and it kind of exposed that while the United States was the pioneer of whistleblower rights, um, First Nation, in some ways our rights are the dinosaur rights now. And we haven't kept pace with um, the global best practice standards in the rest of the world. And that kind of leads to the fourth hit, which is working to get legislation for stronger free speech protections. And um, that's what the, uh, all the people I think on this panel have been committed to. And thanks to the uh, election results, there's a lot of opportunities now. Um, in fact, the Make It Safe Coalition is working on about 40 whistleblower bills, and um, we're happy to have a chance to share with people some of the highest priorities. Yes, very exciting. Um, so, Irvin, you are actually from the same organization as Tom. So I'd like to start with you, since there's already been a bit of an overview of the organization, to go into some of the legislative and policy interests that you've been advancing in your role there. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Siri. And Thanks also to Steve and the entire team at National Whistleblower Center for all of the incredible organizing work they've done around Whistleblowing Day this year. I'll kick it off by saying that I'm the Deputy Director for Legislation at Government Accountability Project. I'm also a National Security Analyst here, which means I work on whistleblowing legislation. I also work with whistleblowers, especially National Security whistleblowers, as a member of the legal teams. I'll share some of the top priority pieces of legislation we've been trying to work on here at Government Accountability Project and as a community with Make It Safe Coalition and other whistleblowing and other advocacy NGOs that support good government. First, we've been focused heavily on protections for law enforcement officers, specifically providing them with whistleblowing and anti-retaliation protections because murder has always been illegal. But the problem is proving the crime. You know, there's not always going to be a heroic civilian bystander with a smartphone to record police abuses and other injustices. Often, the justice is going to depend on honest law enforcement officers providing the evidence. But before they can provide the evidence, they face a double-barreled threat. First, the blue wall of silence. It's not only a cultural tradition to cover up abuses, but also one that, if crossed, means sacrificing your career and even risking your life. Second, they must accept that future, all those risks, without any meaningful legal protections against retaliation. If law enforcement whistleblowers cannot defend themselves, it's unrealistic to expect that they'll be willing to risk everything to defend the public and step forward to provide witness testimony and make other whistleblowing disclosures in the public's interest. Next, we've been working with beyond just the state and local level on federal law enforcement whistleblowing protections specifically for the Federal Bureau of Investigations and FBI employees. One of the least effective whistleblowing laws in the books, uh, although I will say Steve has had some very successful cases uh, representing FBI whistleblowers, but we're trying to improve the FBI whistleblowing system. The Civil Service Reform Act first authorized the FBI to create its own equivalent system for merit system principles, including whistleblower protections. Unfortunately, the policy was non-existent for over a decade and since then has been a caricature of the rights included in the Whistleblowing Protection Act of 1989. Disturbingly, the system of rights to protect FBI whistleblowers for all practical purposes is the FBI's internal management issuing unpublished decisions that routinely rubber stamp whatever retaliation is challenged. There have been recent attempts at reform through FBI Whistleblower Protection Enhancement Acts back in 2015, 2016. We're very eager to revive these attempts. And hopefully this Congress will actually see some justice for FBI whistleblowers and enact a stronger system. Third priority is intelligence community whistleblowing. The whistleblowing for system for the intelligence community employees is nascent. It's not even 10 years old. But experts and whistleblowers alike recognize it's been broken for some time. There was a public spotlight on this system during the last administration that highlighted already extant problems and revealed a few more loopholes. We want to continue our work from last Congress to ensure that intelligence community whistleblowers are protected with best practice whistleblowing protections. They need to have the best practice rights available because they have some of the highest stakes disclosures that are that face our country. They need to be able to report waste, fraud, and abuse, violations of laws, rules, and regulations, urgent concerns freely and without the fear of reprisal. Thank you so much, Siri. Thank you, Irvin. That was a great kickoff to our legislative discussion. So Melissa, would you like to take the next stab at it? Sure, I'd love to. 
Um, so the major whistleblower related legislation uh, that POGO and POGO as a part of the Make It Safe Coalition uh, that we're focused on right now is HR 2988, also known as the Whistleblower Protection Improvement Act or WPIA. So this is a piece of legislation that's sponsored by House Oversight Chairwoman Carolyn Maloney out of New York and Representative Nancy Mace out of South Carolina. Uh, the WPIA recently passed out of the House Oversight Committee on a bipartisan voice vote, which is great. And the next step would be a vote uh, on the floor of the House. And just to let people know, you know, the last large package of reforms in the whistleblower uh, reform space was back in 2012. So uh, back in 2012, we had the Whistleblower Protection Enhancement Act, uh, and now we have the WPIA. So these uh, protections are absolutely overdue. I will say, and just for time's sake, I'm just going to mention a couple features of the WPIA, but they would give, and well, I'm talking about whistleblowers here, I'm talking about uh, Title V federal government whistleblowers, uh, they would get some key protections that they're currently missing. So first, it would uh, ensure that there's access to a court and jury trials to help them seek justice. Um, almost all other whistleblowers in the United States labor force already have a due process right to be able to go to trial with their claims, uh, but federal whistleblowers do not. So this would help more whistleblowers get their cases heard, especially since the only administrative remedy that whistleblowers have right now is going through the Merit Systems Protection Board, which has been absolutely paralyzed since January of 2017. They have an over 3,000 case backlog that they need to get through. And once it becomes functional, I will say President Biden has announced nominees for a chair and vice chair of MSPB, but they need to catch up on the backlog before any new claims could be heard. So having access to jury trials is essential. I'd also say that uh, another key uh, protection would be protecting whistleblowers from retaliatory investigations. This can uh, cause whistleblowers to be frightened into silence and they wouldn't be able to come forward or it leads to a criminal referral. Uh, this has been the most common type of retaliation that we've seen after the 2012 reforms. Uh, there's also a chance that uh, whistleblowers would be able to obtain temporary relief um, because currently right now they cannot get that. And I'll also mention uh, for the administrative side, there would be a mandatory certification of uh, WPA or Whistleblower Protection Act training for the administrative judges because the administrative judges, the way that they've acted towards whistleblowers, some of these interpretations have been pretty uh, hostile and the training has been, and I can leave this to Tom and others to talk about, but the training has been really, really helpful in other countries across the world. And so we think that would make a real big uh, significant difference here. Thank you, Melissa. And Steve. Hi, Siri, and thank you. And it's an honor to be here. Uh, our focus as, is on laws that will allow whistleblowers to win and win big. Uh, we all know that whistleblowers suffer tremendous retaliation and they're just case after case. So we're looking for laws that let whistleblowers file anonymous and confidential claims. So those who want to retaliate against them won't even know who they are. We're looking for laws that shift the basis of compensation from retaliation to oversight. And what I mean is under the traditional whistleblower law, the whistleblower gets money to correspond with how much they've suffered. It, you know, do you really wanna get that million dollar judgment? I mean, uh, Jackie knows what whistleblowers go through, what type of emotional distress or trauma they have. So your compensation is based on how many years have you been out of work? How much have you lost in your retirement? How much has your career been smashed? That's not a very pleasant place to be. So what we're looking for are laws that shift that. And it first looks at confidentiality. So the boss doesn't know who you are. And then it says, we'll compensate you on the quality of your information, which is, if you can give us good usable information that results in an actual enforcement action against a wrongdoer. So this really incentivizes high quality tips, high quality evidence, which is just what most whistleblowers are interested in in the first place. That's why whistleblowers put it all out there. 
They want reform. They want oversight. They want to report corruption. So you want to channel that. And the, the model for this really is something known as the Dodd-Frank Act. It was really a revolutionary law that Congress passed in 2010. It's a fantastic model. It's been working very well. And we're looking to expand that model in other areas. Right now it's money laundering because that's a big issue. Also antitrust, that's a big issue and wildlife protection. And wildlife often doesn't get a, a, enough attention as it should, but it's a multi-billion dollar industry in deforestation, fishing, uh, things that impact climate all over the place. And there's really very little whistleblower protections in that. And Dodd-Frank would be a really good fix. I also wanna say that, and want to add to, one of our other highest priorities is getting court access for federal employees. And it's across the board. Federal employees in the United States have some of the absolute worst protections anywhere. It's a terrible, terrible system. The administrative process that has been designed to protect them has never worked since 1978. There've been numerous attempts at reform time and time again. Tom has been in the leadership of many of these. And every time we pass a new reform law, it's like, oh, we're just gonna get fixed. And it didn't get fixed. The only fix in our view is to get jury trials, get court access for federal employees, and the Make It Safe Coalition is the leading coalition to push that. And we're proud to be working with them. Thank you, Steve. Andrew? Man, it is, it is really hard to follow up uh, uh, on Steve and Melissa. Um, uh, I, I, I would echo by and large everything that they shared, some of the important bills that, that, that uh, are important initiatives that Urban mentioned. I um, might be better sort of, sort of uh, taking a step back here and, and um, uh, so emphasizing, first of all, that, that I think for NTU, our, our, our top priority among many um, uh, meritorious uh, proposals out there is, is to get WPIA uh, or some substantially similar legislative vehicle passed into law. What I mean by substantially similar legislative vehicle, because because those of us steeped in in the ins and outs, the crazy ins and outs of Capitol Hill, uh, may understand what I'm talking about, but but maybe not all listeners or viewers here uh, would would uh, would understand that concept uh, right from the get go. Um, you know, uh, we're proud and strong proposer, uh, uh, proud and strong supporters of WPIA. Uh, we are really pleased that it's bipartisan, and I know. My organization, and I think every organization on here that supports WPIA has been deeply appreciative of Representative Nancy Mace's leadership on the Republican side in co-sponsoring this legislation. But uh, as with any bill uh, in Congress, uh, whether it's a spending bill or a, or, or a revenue bill or, or a good government bill like WPIA, uh, it, it, when if and when it passes one chamber of Congress, uh, oftentimes the other chamber of Congress doesn't just uh, take that bill wholesale and say, yep, that sounds great. Uh, uh, we're going to do exactly that because uh, there, are, there are some healthy rivalries between the Senate and the House. Uh, for, forget even the rivalries between the parties. Uh, there, there are uh, uh, legislators and, and uh, influential members of Congress in both chambers that, that um, uh, often want to take good proposals like WPIA and, and evaluate them on an independent basis. So a lot of work that we're doing right now, this is a lot of table setting, but but really the, the bottom line that I want to share is a lot of the work we're doing right now is talking with our friends in the Senate, both on the Republican and the Democratic side, to figure out um, uh, how best we can get the package of reforms in WPIA passed into law. And, you know, that might not be in an exact bill that is exactly titled the Whistleblower Protection Improvement Act. Uh, it may uh, come as many legislative initiatives do in some larger legislative package that gets considered by Congress later this year. But uh, what we're doing is talking with whistleblower champions in the Senate uh, who really cross the ideological spectrum. All of our organizations, I think, have done work with Senator Chuck Grassley's team. He's widely seen as a whistleblower champion on the right. Uh, all of our organizations have done work, uh, with example, for Sen with Senator Elizabeth Warren on the left, who is uh, who is uh, who introduced uh, co-introduced a bill that would uh, enhance whistleblower protections for folks um, 
folks calling out abuse or, or, or waste of government funds, specifically for COVID-19 relief funds, uh, which with so much money going out the door in COVID-19 relief funds, that is a particularly important initiative. So we're really working across the ideological spectrum and figuring out, you know, we're celebrating the fact that the Whistleblower Protection Improvement Act uh, passed uh, the House Oversight and Reform Committee. We're hoping that it gets a vote in the House on the House floor and gets passed by the House eventually. But even if and when it gets passed by the House, we're going to need to figure out what's possible and what's going to be able to get through the Senate. And so we're doing a lot of that table setting work right now. Uh, and luckily, there are a number of champions uh, in, in, in the Senate that we can work with to begin to have those initial conversations. Thank you, Andrew. That was really good context. So Jackie, you mentioned briefly some of the legislative initiatives or the values that you want to make sure legislation includes. Is there more that you'd like to say on the topic? Yeah, so I, I think, and you know, and I and I certainly appreciate what Steve said. In an ideal world, and if there were nirvana, whistleblowers would be the hero over every organization, and every time you blew the whistle, you got an award. But we know that's not the case, and that this um, retaliation, harassment, and discrimination is ongoing. But what I find is that it's very hard to parse out what that means. And so one of the things I've done very distinctly is we've created a whistleblower retaliation checklist with um, uh, nine domains and about uh, 75 indicators for each of the domains to help people really identify how retaliation is systemic and targeting that it's not you know it's more than just having a mean boss or somebody who doesn't like your hairstyle you need to really be able to explain and prove how these these uh, microaggressions are really harmful and can cause people to have ptsd and depression and become suicidal we've done a survey and we found that half of the people we surveyed have reported some sort of suicidal ideation. So it's more than just about losing your job. It's about having your di identity disrupted, sur um, suffering a moral injury, having your worldview shattered. I mean, there's an entire psychological domain here that I think gets often ignored. So, I mean, that's a big part of what we're looking at um, and trying to change the conversation about. Um, in terms of very specific legislative language, um, one of the things that I, I kind of fill the role and work very closely with everybody else here on the Make It Safe Coalition is on um, the VA and its Office of, Whistle of Accountability and Whistleblower Protection, the OAWP. And the, um, the, there's been some hearings, there's been multiple hearings over the last few years because there is an organization um, they are probably the largest federal employee, but they've also generated uh, at least half of the cases, I believe, at Office of Special Counsel. I know VA employees are almost half of, and we've had over a thousand connections in just the few years that we've been an organization. Uh, a good number of those are VA employees. So when Representative Pappas and Representative Mann each introduced legislation related to OAWP and how to best fix this for um, VA employees. And this means a lot to me because I am a veteran. I was an army officer um, and I've been I've been a VA employee. I've been a, a DOD employee. So these issues are near and dear to my heart. Um, we definitely need uh, an office, an OAWP that is independent, unbiased and functions a lot better than it has in the past. Um, I have hope that now that there is a new assistant secretary that Marianne Dowardy, I think is how we pronounce that, is, is new in, in place, that we might see some new momentum moving forward. But I think that um, uh, the bill that Representative Mann introduced to really parse out the um, role of the investigation should really go over to the Office of Special Counsel. I've really supported that because I do think you need that um, independence. You need to be separating out. And you know, as somebody who's been a government manager, I look at the um, I look at the taxpayer bill on all of this, Andrew, and I think, why are we duplicating this effort? We're paying twice for an investigation that one organization has really been set up and is 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 good at. Now, maybe it's not the best at, and maybe it could use some more resources to accomplish this mission. 
I'm hoping that as um, uh, this bipartisan effort comes together and that VA and OSC can have a better dialogue about how to move forward on this, I'm hoping that we'll get a better independent process. I see the role for OAWP as being able to do this, um, what I call a duty to assist, to be able to provide the mentorship and the support and help employees understand level of evidence. Um, I'm probably one of the few of you who's not an attorney. Um, that was something that made me pause. What is preponderance? What is clear and convincing? What is reasonable doubt? Employees don't know that. And we need to be walked through the process to help somebody understand, well, if you're gonna file a complaint, this is what you need to know. Don't call your divorce attorney to handle your employment case. Call, call one of these other folks that are on the screen or any other employment law firm. Um, how do you do a FOIA? Um, the VA um, is one of my, one of my pet peeves with the VA is they don't respond well to FOIAs. When I have FOIAed the DOD, I've gotten a treasure trove of information. When I have FOIAed the VA, I've got 250 privacy protected pages. I ask them these same exact questions. So there needs to be a, a lot more work done in all of these areas, I think. And and again, VA is the biggest federal employer, and we're taking we're taking care of veterans. We we need them to be doing this with the utmost integrity and accountability. Yeah, yeah, and it's great that you started talking about next steps and and the real specifics of what needs to happen for a constructive change. So, Tom. If there's any legislative initiatives you want to bring up that Irvin didn't mention, that would be great to do it very briefly now. But but more importantly, what can people do to start advancing some of these goals? How can they get involved? Um, well, my assignment was to kind of go over the corporate private sector rights. And we've got several dozen bills that are on there. I think the most significant is for contractor employees, sweeping in state and local government workers in expanding the scope of whistleblower rights beyond workplace harassment to also cover civil and criminal liability. Um, we're also working hard to restore protection for whistleblowing disclosures within the, within the organization under the Dodd-Frank Act and, and anti-gag provisions to that statute. Um, I do wanna briefly um, just um, pile on about the Whistleblower Protection Improvement Act. The irony uh, of our movement is that the federal workers who have the highest stakes disclosures to contribute the most to the country have the weakest rights of almost any group in the US labor force. And this Whistleblower Protection Improvement Act was two years in the making that we've been working on it. And it's, it's like the promised land. It's the fifth generation of these rights, but it's taken us 44 years to get to the point where we might have credible enforcement of the rights on paper. That's longer than it took Moses to reach the promised land. So this is an important opportunity for us. And um, basically everybody who's involved in this movement needs to get on the horn to their congressmen and senators and tell them to make this a priority. Uh, if they're worried about trillions of dollars of new government spending, um, then how about protecting the people who can expose the fraud, waste, and abuse? This is a litmus test of whether or not there's a reality behind the rhetoric of our politicians, and we have to hold them to it. Very strongly said, Tom. Irvin, is there anything people can do to help advance whistleblower protections for law enforcement? Absolutely. I'd recommend people reach out to Senator Cory Booker, to Senator Charles Grassley, to Senator Tim Scott, to other folks that are involved in police reform negotiations and working on police reform. Uh, that's where we're hoping to actually implement these whistleblowing protections for law enforcement. You can tell these offices that in their whistleblowing protections, they need to protect all witnesses. So if you're a citizen with a smartphone and someone's harassing you, you'd have anti retaliation rights. You should tell them that they need to institute a civil and criminal liability shield for law enforcement whistleblowers, that there needs to be an appropriate administrative remedy with a kick out the federal court to a jury trial. So that way your case isn't languishing in some back file some, in some government office lost in the bureaucracy. Great, thank you. And Melissa, how can people support POGO's work? So people can help uh, POGO and support our work by visiting its pogo.quorum.us. 
uh, and you can sign up to be a POGO advocate for truth tellers. We want to make sure that folks are able to maximize their voice and influence public policy in a way that ensures our government's more open, effective, and accountable. I'll also mention we have uh, specific campaigns going on and we'll have new campaigns going on from our civic engagement team in time for National Whistleblower Day. Uh, and that includes exactly what Tom and Irvin just said, getting people to tell their members of Congress to uh, co-sponsor the WPIA would be one of our asks. Uh, there are 29 co-sponsors on the bill and they are 28 Democrats and one Republican. So we are really pushing for more uh, Republican co-sponsorship and more members to get involved with the WPIA efforts. There will also be a second campaign uh, to tell House leadership, so Speaker Nancy Pelosi and Minority Leader McCarthy to bring the WPIA to a floor vote in the House of Representatives. And I'll also just make a quick plug that everyone can follow us on social media at Pogo Watchdog on Twitter and Instagram, and they can stay up to date on our legislative efforts. And that includes those around National Whistleblower Day. Thank you, Melissa. So Steve, how can people support the legislative initiatives of NWC? Well, first and foremost, the word is organize. Organize. Get off, do something. And the easiest thing people can do is join with these lists. Pogo mentioned there's uh, very important. Uh, GAP has it, other organizations have similar programs where you can simply go online, sign up, get the action alerts, listen to what the advocates are saying. They know where they have to target. They know the specific legislators or members of Congress that need to get pressure. People need to know that whistleblowing is important, that the population supports it. And as you may know, the National Whistleblower Center did a survey. We paid for a survey through the Marist Poll. And the Marist Poll is an A plus rate, one of the most respected objective polls in the country. And guess what? 80% of likely voters across every ideological line rural people, city people, young, old, everyone wants more protections for federal employees. Another 80% wanted more protections for corporate employees. But on the corporate employee side, one quarter, 25% of all likely voters wanted Congress to take immediate action and it would influence their vote. We need to communicate those messages. Whistleblower advocacy is like other major issues, but guess what? Because we have such widespread support, it doesn't fit the narrative of a Democrat and a Republican yelling at each other on MSNBC or whatever. We have bipartisan support. We have to translate that to civic engagement. So at the Whistleblower Center, which is whistleblowerswithaness.org, very simple, sign up. Sign up, follow the alerts, take action, let's get it done. Very well said. So Andrew, you gave a lot of really good context to the discussion we're having. How can people get involved and learn more and take action with your organization? For sure. Well, um, first off, I, I would send them to my peer organizations before I'd send them uh, uh, to us at NTU, just because you all are doing um, uh, so much great work in this space. Uh, what I would say, though, is I would echo what what um, what others have said. If you're represented by Republicans in Congress, uh, if you're represented by a Republican in the House, call your member, ask them if they're willing to co-sponsor um, and join Representative Nancy Mace in supporting the Whistleblower Protection Improvement Act. If you're represented by a Republican in the Senate, consider giving their office call and asking them if they'll work with Democrats in, in, in the weeks and months to come uh, on passing whistleblower legislation that's similar to the WPIA and making sure that we get these robust protect, protections passed into law this year. I think to echo Steve's point, it really um, it, it, it is it is a cruel irony that that uh, as uh, even though whistleblowers are the cornerstone of, of government oversight efforts, um, and protect every taxpayer in this nation, uh, their, their rights and their protections and bolstering those protections are often considered a second or a third order priority by too many 
uh, folks in Congress. And while we have a lot of champions in both parties and in both chambers of Congress pushing for changes right now, we need even more people in Congress to recognize that this is a priority. So uh, I would just, uh, whether you're represented by a Republican or a Democrat in Congress, I would encourage you to call uh, your representatives in Congress, tell them to make this bill and these issues more broadly a priority. Thank you, Andrew. And let's wrap it up with you, Jackie, coming from the heart. Tell us what we can do to better support whistleblowers and get involved in your organization's work. So Whistleblowers of America is a, a very small nonprofit. We do not charge a fee for the peer support. And we probably provide hundreds of hours of it um, as we connect and network and help each other out. So you can go to whistleblowersofamerica.org and donate. That would be a big help. We, um, you know, where you put your money speaks volumes. And we have also believed that the peer support, the advocacy requires um, a, tr a trained person who understands the trauma-informed perspective, understands whistleblower laws. Um, as Tom mentioned, we've, we've got people coming from all over the world that are interested in this issue. They need to know the laws that protect them. Um, so we've started a whistleblower protection advocacy certification program that we've developed 10 hours of curriculum for. So we've launched September 9 and 10 is going to be the Workplace Promise Institute that will provide those 10 hours of training. So anybody can register for that. We're looking for sponsors for that. So workplacepromiseinstitute.org is the other website you can go to and join the effort to help actually train advocates to help lift, lift up other employees as they go through this. Many of our um, employees do go to Congress and they need to learn how to work with members of Congress, members of the media. These are not always easy, safe stories to tell and people really need to know and be encouraged how to write their narrative, how to put together their timeline. So those are all the things we're trying to do with our Workplace Promise Institute and and get people certified and really knowledgeable in this because everybody deserves a safe place to work. Thank you so much everybody for this fantastic panel. Thank you for the Make It Safe Coalition for all the great work that we are doing together. I think this panel really demonstrates the value of working in unity and how good it feels when we can all work together and discuss important issues. So please, if you're in the audience, if you're a whistleblower and you feel alone today, I want you to know that you're not alone. We're all fighting for you. We're all here with you. And we encourage you to check out the resources we talked about today. If you wanna contact your Congress people, each one of us has websites that will help you figure out how, when, and what to say. So just check out our websites, especially www.whistleblowers.org. That's whistleblowers with an S to see what National Whistleblower Center has to offer. And definitely check out Whistleblower Network News for breaking whistleblower news, which always covers the latest activities of these organizations. Thank you for joining us today.